ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير حد حد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر امور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار يا ايها الاخوه واخوات السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته اوصيكم جميعا ونفسي اولا اتقوا الله عز وجل oh brothers and sisters i extend the islamic salutations to you all and i advise myself as well as you all to collectively to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know that I remind myself before beginning this talk with the statement of Musa alayhi salatu wa salam the one who says Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri وَحْلُلْ أُقْدَةً مِّنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِ In these tremendous verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentioned that Musa alayhi salatu salam, when he was commissioned as a messenger to go speak to Fir'aun, He mentioned to Allah azza wa jal, O oh my Lord, expand my breasts and make easy my affair and loosen the knot that's in my tongue. Because he had a speech impediment, as is mentioned in the tafsir, that he wasn't so eloquently or that he wasn't so easy to speak as his brother Harun. And I used these verses and he said, Yafqa Hukoli, in order for the people to understand me. So when I address the people, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the dua of Musa to allow me to address you all in a former matter where it's through the words, inshallah ta'ala can reach you and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this talk beneficial as well as sincere for his face only and not so that we can turn the people's faces towards ourselves and we would like to thank the people who invited us to give this tremendous talk because it's an honor no doubt um, from the 5-2 initiative our brothers for us to speak about a tremendous topic which is developing taqwa which is developing taqwa to resist social ills and before beginning I just want to remind you that the most or the truthful time that you will see that you will ever hear me being the most truthful, uh, the most sincere is when you hear me recite the book of Allah or speak with the book of Allah or you hear me speak with the son of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Henceforth the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said, kitab Allah. He said, Rally, the most truthful speech is the book of Allah. And the best guidance wa khayru huda, the best guidance is the guidance of that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So social ills in taqwa, okay? The ulama, they have explained or defined a taqwa to mean it is to carry out the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon a light from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while hoping for his reward. And it is to leave off falling into the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon a light from Allah by fearing his punishment. And in summary, taqwa can also mean, because there's many definitions, is to place a barrier between yourself and those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislike as a protection whereby those things doesn't reach you. And if you cannot... For example, if this protection does not cover you or does not protect you, then you fall at least under the threat of the loss of 
subhanahu wa ta'ala in regards to punishment. So this is how the ulama explain taqwa. And this is a simple definition that we use to explain taqwa. So how do we understand using taqwa as a means to resist social ills? What is social ills? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, um, he talks about a lot of different things, which not only the Anbiya and the Rusul and the Messengers, they warned against Tawheed and they also warned against Shirk. But they also addressed it, the social ills of their respective communities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْخَمْرِ وَالْمَيْسِرِ قُلْ فِيهِمَا إِثْمٌ كَبِيرٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْعِهِمَا He mentioned in this tremendous verse in Surah Baqarah, Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, they asked you, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about khamar. They asked you about intoxicants. And they asked you about gambling. Say that rally, they are a tremendous sin, meaning they are a major sin. And that the, they are a benefit for mankind, meaning mankind takes it as a means of a benefit. I'm not saying that Allah Azza wa Jal saying that they are an actual benefit in a sense of being a benefit for their soul, etc., etc. But mankind take pleasure, they take delight, the they find these things to be beneficial to themselves. But Allah said, وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِن نَفْعِهِمَا He said that the, their sin, meaning both intoxicant and gambling, is graver, it's more serious, okay, than the benefit contained within these things. When you gamble and someone reaps a benefit, someone loses out, but someone gains. When drinking or when partaking in any intox intoxicant, there are some chemical things that happen to the brain. There are some things that happen to the body. You find yourself becoming pleasure or being at please. And then for the people who sell it and for the people who actually make it and distribute these type of things, they actually gain. Drinking and gambling is a social ill. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَلَا تَقُتُلُوا نَفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقُّ In this ayat, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, do not take the life of a soul unjustly or unjustifiable except uh, would do right meaning according to the law of Kisos so in that verse Allah Jalla wa is telling us murder is a social ill murder can be done by multiple reasons but it also is a social ill also Allah Azza wa Jalla he addressed the issue of وَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعَ وَحَرَّمَ الْرِبَى and Allah Azza wa Jal, He has made permissible trade, buying and selling, but He has made impermissible usury, interest. That is a social ill. Everything you normally hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reprimanding in the Quran that deals with society and that can harm society at large is a social ill. And from these verses, you can see that Allah Azza wa Jal allowed the messengers to address the people pertaining to their social ills, okay? But they started with a format, and that format was simple. They started with the eternal before the external, meaning in terms of a tawheed purifying their hearts so that when the commands and the prohibitions came down, they can be able to submit towards those things because they understood the connection between them and their Lord, okay? So, we can't forget that process. So, I'm going to use a different approach today to address the issue of taqwa and resisting social ills. I'm going to use the example of the Prophet wasallam, And I'm going to take these particular verses that we're going to recite, and we're going to analyze them, and we're going to highlight the key points to help us resist social ills. Developing this taqwa, how is to be developed, as well as how to resist social ills. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, you have a beautiful example. The following verses, Allah Azza wa Jal instruct the Prophet Wasallam how to deal with his community, how to deal with society at large, what he should equip himself with, and what he should do. 
And this is what we want to use, inshallah ta'ala, today for this talk. How to develop this taqwa and how to resist the social ills we find ourselves in. Not just from gambling, not from drinking, not from smoking, not from taking all types of substance abuse, not from just robbing, stealing, as Allah said, Wala sari, wala, Allah Jalla said, Wasari ku wasari katu fakutu. Not just Allah Azza wa Sallam that the male and the female thief cut off both of their hands, even though thievery and robbery is a form of social ills. And Allah said, Wa awful and weigh with good measuring. Weigh lil mutafifin, knowing that giving less than what measuring was due or demanding more than what actually do, this is a social ill. People cheating people, this is a form of social ill. You understand? It, dis it disrupts society. So Allah Azza wa Jalla tells Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the 74th chapter of the Quran Allah Azza wa Jalla says A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Ya ayyuhal mutathir kum fa antir wa rabbaka fa kabbir wa thiyabaka fa tahhir wa ar-rujsa fa hajur wa la tastakthir in these following verses, Allah Azza wa Jal is telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam how to deal with his community and how to avoid the pitfalls and the social pitfalls and the ills. Allah Azza wa Jal, he addressed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by saying, Ya Ayyuhal Mutathir, O you who are enveloped in garments. Both in Sahih Muslim as well as in Sahih Bukhari in the book of Revelation, they address the issue of the tafsir of these following verses. And they mention how the Prophet ﷺ, he came back after seeing the angel and he told his wife Khadija anha, tathurni, tathurni, as well as zumilani, zumilani, as in the surah that comes before it, which is Muzammil. And even Sa'di said that both of them mean the same thing. To cover him. He told his wife to cover him. Then Allah told him, Kum fa'andir. Now I want you to understand, he was made a prophet with Iqra, but then he was made a proclaimer to come out to his society and to warn. He was made a nadir, a warner, a messenger, as they say, with this particular sword. So Allah told him, Arise and warn. Arise and warn. Okay? So you might say, what does this have to do with taqwa and resisting social ills? The first piece of armory that you must have in order to fight against social ills and is also a part of taqwa is ilm. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, What taqullah you alimukum Allah. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, have taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jalla and He will instruct you. He will teach you. Meaning He will give you ilm. Taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is based upon that type of ilm. You want that ilm, you will have this type of fear in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah telling Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, arise and warn, okay? Arise and warn, meaning call your people as Ibn the al the Sa'di. mentioned in this tafsir, he says what this means is that he was encouraged by Allah Azza wa Jal to warn the people by way of statements and by way of actions. This is what Allah Azza wa Jal was telling the Prophet وسلم, clarifying the condition of the one who warns and the one whom uh, is being warned from. So in order for them to leave off that which they are being warned from. So in part of fighting social ills, is that we must call against it, is the point I'm trying to make. We must be callers against it. We must arm ourselves with ilm, with knowledge. We must arm ourselves with ilm. And ilm here, we talk about ilm sharia, kitab Allah wa sunnah, ala fahma salaf. We must arm ourselves with knowledge, meaning knowledge of Allah's legislation, which is the book of Allah and the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon the understanding of the righteous predecessors. We must arm ourselves with that and to fight social ills, whether it's on the individual level or it's on a collective level, we must first and foremost fight the social ills by way of 
calling against it, warning against it. This is the first line of defense. Arming yourself with that knowledge and then calling against those things that go against the society, that goes against the soundness and the peace and the harmony of society. Warn against it. Allah said, فَقُمْ فَأَنْذِرْ Rise and warn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not telling His Prophet وسلم, to take the back seat. To allow sins to just be rampant. This is why Al-Amru bil Ma'roof wa Nahi an Munkar, commanding the good, forbidding the evil, is a fundamental principle in the deen, in Islam. It's a fundamental principle. That Allah only does not only Allah Azza wa Jal describe the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with this characteristic, that if Allah give them secession, as he says in Surah Al-Hajj, if he was to give them secession in the land, they will be those who do what? They will establish Allah Tawheed, they will warn against shirk, and they will command the good and they will prohibit the evil. So Allah Azza wa Jal said that Muhammad inna arsalnaka mubashiran wa nadira. Indeed, we have sent you as a mubashir, one who gives glad tidings, okay, of Jannah and the belief in Allah, etc., etc. And we sent you as a nadir, someone who warn against shirk, warn against kufr, warn against bid'ah, warn against Dunu, these things must be openly warned against. That's number one. It's conditions, no doubt, but that's number one. That's how we fight and combat social ills or resist them. We cannot remain silent, and this should be done with our statement and our actions. Okay. Next, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Wa Rabbaka fakabir." In other words, magnify your Lord. Ronerate your Lord. Human Sa'adi says, magnify him by way of singling him out alone, by worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon Tawheed. And to make him your objective, him your goal, within you warning. You're warning by the face of Allah Azza wa Jal. Meaning, in other words, you're seeking Allah's face by warning the people from that which they are doing. You're not seeking to gain any status. You're not seeking to gain any benefit. You're not seeking to gain any wages. You're not seeking to gain anything of a reputable re reputation, etc. None of that. You're calling and you're establishing this thing only by seeking the face of Allah Azza wa Jal. So our second thing is that we must magnify the Creator. Who gave us the strength to call against social ills. To call against things that destroy the very fabric of society. This is what Islam does. One of the five things that Islam preserves is not only the people's honor, not only the shedding of blood, not only the wealth, but it preserves life. So when you look at the five objectives of the Sharia, ah, you see that the very objectives of the Sharia of itself, it is to what? Establish a society that is free of these social ills. And that when we come in contact with these social ills, we know how to deal with them. We just look at the Prophet. He had to go out towards the people who were burying a female infants alive. People who were robbing, stealing. People who had more than just one wife or being oppressive. People who were destroying Tribal wars, people were committing shirk, which was graver than all of these things. And the Kaaba, going around it naked. People who were doing whatever they wanted to do. You're talking about social ills at an all-time high. He had to go out and call these people. He had to rectify them. But he had to make sure he was a muwahid. He had to make sure that the main focus for whatever he was doing had to been for Allah Azza wa Jalla. He had to make sure that he magnify Allah because that's where his protection was coming from. He had to make sure that he had the connection with Allah because that's where his protection was coming from. And the moment that we stand forth in front of anybody and we severed that tie between us and Allah and we become like the people that we're trying to warn from, it won't work. It won't work. You will not be able to fight social ills if you're falling into the social ills. 
You understand? It won't work. You have to keep that connection. For Wabbaka Fakabbir, Allah told Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to magnify him with at tuhid Okay? Meaning, in other words, you addamuhu ibad, wa yakumu bi ibadatihi. That you instill inside the worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by establishing his tawheed by way of worship. That you be an avid worshipper. You want to call to the good, you want to prohibit from evil, you need to be an avid worshipper. There's no such thing of you not being an abd. You have to be a worshipper. In order to call to the good and prohibit the evil, you must be an avid worshiper. In order to take on the attribute of being a warner, which is your job, to call against social ills, whether it's on a individual level or whether it's on a collective level, you have to be an avid worshiper. Notice how everything connects. Allah Jalla he says in the next verse, after mention more at the mention Allah said Here Now Allah Azza wa Jal He dresses The thiyab The outer garments Of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And the ulama Of the past From the amongst the Sahabas And the Tabi'een As well as even Iman Sa'id We're going to quote What he's going to say That it falls under two Both in a spiritual essence And tangible Ma'nawiyan And both in a Hissi in a physical way so Allah Azza wa Jal, when he was telling him to purify his garments, Ibn Sa'id, he said that it's possible that what could be intended by his garment here is all of his actions. This is a ma'nawiyah meaning. In other words, not the garment itself, but the actions of the Prophet ﷺ was referred to as a garment. All of his actions. Meaning, in other words, he purified them by keeping them mainly and solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sake and free of any of the things that will invalidate those actions. So, not only is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told to keep himself well kept, to keep his garments free of stains, as it come later on in Iman Sa'adi's statement, that keeping the, the garments included in this is keeping the garments free from the jasa. Any impurity, okay, that is hisian, that is physical. But first and foremost, his actions must be free from shirk, free from kufr, free from committing partners with Allah, free from disbelief, free from innovation, free from the sins or different evils. It had to be free. So Allah Jalla wa Ala is saying that he must be purified. And notice how each of these things in arrangement. Call against, warn against the social ills. Warn against those things that destroy the fabric of society. Okay? Two, magnify your Lord by being an avid worshiper. Meaning that you have to be an example to the people that you're calling. If you understand what that means. You have to keep a connection with your creator and be an example to the people you're calling. Three, these are means to help us resist and all of these actions that we're talking about, by the way, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a muttaqi. As Allah said, Ya Ayyuha Nabi, ittaqallaha. O you who, O, o Prophet, fear Allah Azza wa Jal, wa la tuti'r, and do not obey the munafikeen wal kafirin. Wal kafirin wal do not obey those who are disbelievers or hypocrites. Allah tells Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to ittaqallaha. He was a muttaqi. He was one who feared Allah Azza wa Jal. So having these things, you have taqwa. The next statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, <laughs> Notice the levels. The next thing you must do is now make hajr. You must boycott. You must abandon. You must forsake. You must leave off shirk. And all of its manifestations, as well as its people. I want you to pay attention now. Al Ruz, as the ulama they mentioned, as Imam Sa'adi said here, that what is to be understood from Al Ruz is Al Asnamu wal Awthan. Okay? 
One of the meanings is those things that people take as deities or worships like idols, things that they carve, things they use to worship. He said those things which are worshipped along with Allah. Here the Prophet has been commanded to lead them off and to disassociate himself from those things. So, idolatry, committing partners with Allah, whether it be an idol, whether it be a saint, whether it be a prophet, whether it be an angel, etc., etc., all of these things must be abandoned. And if you pay attention closely, you will see that in these verses, the first thing Allah Azawajal told the Prophet to do was practice Tawheed. And then he tells them later, showing you that both of these have to go hand in hand. It's not, it's not possible that you can be a muwahid, one who practices Tawheed, and you're not a person who stay away from shirk. I want you to understand, to understand here the connection. It's not possible that you can be a person who practices Tawheed and not stay away from shirk. It's not possible. They have to go hand in hand. This is why Allah says it to the Prophet Sallallahu He says to him, And as for the shirk and his remnants and his people, dissociate yourself totally from it. And this is resisting social ills. Think about it. I just want you to think about how this is. Freeing yourself from people who worship others along with Allah Azza wa Jal. People who worship others along, along with Allah Azza wa Jal, what do they normally do? They don't have what we call morality. There's no check and balance. When you find a person worshiping anything besides Allah Azza wa Jal, there's no check and balance. They do what they want to do. They are catalysts for destruction. And they don't have nothing stopping them or preventing them from carrying themselves the way they carry themselves. So Allah Azza wa Jal is telling Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, stay clear of these people. Warn against that which they're doing, but stay clear of them to make sure you remove yourself from the social ills. You want to resist gambling. You want to resist um, robbing, cheating, stealing. How are you going to do that? By walking up to somebody telling them not to steal? By walking up to somebody telling them not to gamble, not to cheat? No. Allah didn't do that. When Allah Azza wa Jal sent down the Quran and the companions were drinking and they were dealing with Khamar, Allah Azza wa Jal did not tell the people to stop doing what they were doing. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, our mother, she said, had Allah started with the prohibitions, they would have never done it. Allah addressed it a different way, which we should do, which they call this tarabiyah to ilahiyah. This is divine tarabiyah, cultivation. Look how Allah Azza wa Jal addressed the issue. He dealt with the matter of the hearts. He dealt with that first, the eternal, before the external. And he did it in three stages Within three verses The first verse I already quoted for you That was the verse I mentioned earlier Yes, Allah mentioned about the khamr there And the gambling But he doesn't prohibit it He said that it is a benefit for mankind But their sin outweigh Or they're more graver than the benefit But he still didn't prohibit it the next time he mentions in Surah Nisa, the fourth chapter of the Quran, at different times, Allah said, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, la taqurabu salata wa antum sukara. O you who believe, do not approach the prayer while you are in an intoxicant state. Hatta ta'alamu ma taqulu, until you know that what you're actually saying. As Ibn Kathir mentioned in the tafsir that there were some companions who were reciting and that they would mix up the verse or the words of the verse due to them being intoxicant while trying to pray. Allah still doesn't prohibit it. So as the time going, Allah is still cultivating their hearts eternally so they can, they can be susceptible to the actual outward command. Then Allah Jalla wa Ala, He sends down Hal Antum Muntahun Fi Surah Ma'idah, the fifth chapter. In a different time period. Now he tells them to cease. As Umar ibn al-Khattab in the tafsir, he said that you saw the people pulling out the khamma and breaking the pots and so forth that made it when this verse came down. But look how Allah Azza wa Jal took them from stage to stage to stage in order to address these issues. So when you're dealing with someone that is Fighting, whether it's an addiction, whether it's a substance abuse, whether it's a gambling, which is another form of addiction, whether it's robbing, cheating, lying, 
If you're dealing with people with these type of sins or these type of um, diseases, because in Islam they're known as diseases. If you're dealing with people with these type of things, then it's a certain way that you have to approach them. You understand what I'm saying? There's a certain way that you should approach them and how to get them on the level they need to be on. You do not approach them while they're intoxicated. I'm going to repeat that again. You do not approach them while they're in the state of intoxication. At this point, they are not in the right state of mind. Henceforth, this is why khamr has been prohibited. Because you're not in your right state of mind. Look at the hadith of Uthman ibn Affan anhu, Which I'm going to summarize it's, 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 I'm not going to, It's not supposed to be a long talk I'm going to summarize it Where he mentioned that there was a Prostitute Who was calling an abbot, a worshipper To come Fornicate with her So she gave him a choice She said either fornicate with me Or drink the khamar Or kill this boy He had three choices so in his mind, he wanted to pick the less of the evil. So he chose the Khamer. He didn't want to kill nobody because that's a grave sin to kill someone. He didn't want to have sex with her because that was a grave sin. So he figured if he drink the Khamer, he will harm only himself. So he drinks the Khamer, and then he winds up sleeping with the, the woman anyway, and he go ahead and kills the boy anyway. So he does all three, just from the Khamer. The Hadith showing us that what? That when you are outside of your mind, when you are intoxicated, then in that state, you are not to be approached. Do you understand? That's not hikmah. You're not to be approached with commands and prohibitions at the time that you are intoxicated. We don't understand this. So dealing with people that are faced with any type of intoxication, whether it don't have to be drinking, okay? It don't have to be any form of um, intoxication. You know, sex is a drug. You might say, brother, you tripping. Actually, they actually have sex therapists. They have people who are addicted to sex. And then you understand why Allah placed what we call balance and everything. Because you could go too much to the left or too much to the right. It's a balance for everything. There are people who are addicted to eating. They call it glutton. And you see they're obese. They're actually beyond weight of their natural weight that they're supposed to have. There are people who sleep entirely too much. All of these things, by the way, harms the heart. As Ibn Qayyim said, there are four things that, that cause the heart to be hardened. Too much sexual activity. Don't care if it's permissible. Too much sleeping. Too much excessive talking without remembering Allah as a wajal. Huh? And too much eating. And in one port, he mentioned too much laughing. You have to have a balance. That's what these things are there so that, what, there can be order. So all of these things, as we said, is mentioned in these points that we're trying to show you. The Prophet ﷺ had to go address a society. Allah addressed them with the following verses to deal with the society and their social ills. He told them to stand up and rise. Warned them from what? At the top of the list, as shirk Not khamr. Not riba. Not gambling, not prostitution, not zina, not robbing, not killing, not cheating, not any of those things. But the top of the list he had to warn the people from was a shirk in many of his manifestations. That's number one. He had to warn them from that. Because if they don't understand the connection between them and their Lord, what's the point? There's no check and balances. How do you deal with someone who doesn't care about Allah as a watch out? How do you deal with someone who doesn't? They don't have a conscience. How do you deal with someone like that? There's a certain way that they have to be dealt with. So you have to start with the top important thing to deal with the social ills. That's warn the people against shirk. And don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid to warn the people of cutting and severing the tie between them and their Lord. Because that's what shirk is. When you commit that crime of calling on someone who doesn't deserve, who didn't create you, who didn't provide for you, who didn't do etc., etc., and who didn't give you life and everything, you are committing the gravest crime you can commit. And by doing that, you are cutting off that connection between you and your Lord. 
what you need in order to survive. So you start with that to deal with social ills. Then the second thing you do is that you start with Tawheed. <laughs> you know, you're not seeing it? Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says, well, Rabbaka Now you have to be an avid worshiper yourself. You have to be a person that calls to Tawheed and magnify his Lord and be an example to others. This is how you resist social ills. Then Allah says, what next? Now you have to make sure you purify, clean your actions, as well as your statements, as well as your heart, as well as your outer garments. Clean them from impurity. Be immaculate. I'm not talking about wear the latest fashion or name brand. That's not immaculate. Be immaculate in terms of your cleanliness. As the Prophet said, Shatara Iman. That cleanliness is half of Iman. So understanding these things is important. This is how we resist. And this is how we develop taqwa to deal with the social ills. This is what the Prophet was, was ordered by his Lord to do. Then Allah told him, Look at the commands. Warn against shirk. Warn against all of these things. Then also magnify Allah with Tawheed. Then purify yourself. Then stay away from people's shirk and his harms. Now Allah Azza wa is touching on these issues. Then he mentioned to him, وَلَا تَمْنُمْ تَسْتَكْثِرُ I want you to pay attention to this part. And this is to prevent yourself from being self-amazed. Allah Azza wa Jalla tell Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Do not count your deeds as a favor to your Lord. There's nothing that you do in society that is good except that it's from Allah. And as long as you know that, you can never become arrogant. It's protect you from kibbutz. It's protect you from pride. It's protect you from looking down on others and belittling people. It protect you from self-amazement. It protect you from being too into yourself, being conceit. If you have a balance, how do you balance yourself? Do not count your favors, what you're doing, as a favor to Allah. Because Allah is the one who's giving you these things. So Allah is telling the Prophet ﷺ to arm himself with these necessary things to address society and to deal with society. We as Muslims must imitate him in that. How do we arm ourselves with these very things? This is what we need to do. And then Allah Jalla wa ala, He ends it so beautifully when He says, Wali Rabbika Fasbir. And He says, And for your Lord's sake, have patience. He ends all of those things with sabr, patience. Because, brothers and sisters, whether you understand it or not, whenever you, regardless of who you are, just to live life, Require patience. Patience is required in every circumstances and every place, every time and every situation. It requires patience. It requires patience. Patience also allows you to understand that you are not on your time, you're on the Creator's time. I hope you understand where I'm going at with that. Patience alarm you to let you know that you're not on your time, you're on the Creator's time. What do I mean by that? By you having to restrain yourself, because that's the meaning of patience, if you don't know. Linguistically, it means habas enough to restrain yourself from what? Following your desires. If you have to restrain yourself from following your own desires, you have to withhold yourself, then you are not on your own time. You are not independent as you are falsely led to believe. You are not on your own time because you have to have a check. You have to stop yourself. You have to restrict yourself. You have to restrain yourself. You cannot do what you want or what you like. And if that's the case, then you're on someone else's time. Who that time is? Allah. Which indicates that you are serving. Which indicates that you need to submit. Which indicates that if you step outside of that patience on behalf of your Lord, then you're going to fall in every social ill there is. Period. It's a check and a balance. How do you check yourself? Subber. Over 90 times Allah mentioned subber in the Quran. You think that that was haphazardly? Subber in everything. Look man to a son. What's be ala what? Be patient upon whatever befalls you. What's be ala ma'asabit? 
whatever calamity, because it's not ever befalls you, actually a sabit, meaning whatever adversity befalls you, you have to be patient. So here Allah Azza wa Jalla is telling Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after doing all of these noble things to address your society and to deal with social ills, now at the end you have to remain patient. That means you have to be patient upon your obedience and carrying those things out. You have to remain patient upon staying away from the social ills themselves that you are calling people from. You have to remain patient by also being pleased and not falling into those things which Allah, which you cannot control and only Allah have control over those things that He allows to happen. You have to have patience. And these are the things that you're going to equip yourself with with taqwa. And all of these things require taqwa. This, these are the things that you're going to use to resist the social ills. And these are the things that we wanted to bring. Because if you look at how Allah Jalla wa Ala talks to the Prophet Sallallahu then this is how we should be. This is why this man, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi life is steady from beginning to end. This is why he had multiple wives, as some of the ulama of hadith, they mentioned, so that we can see different aspects of his life. His life had been steady from beginning to end. What he drink, what he eat, what he wear, how he sleep, what side did he sleep on? How did he dress? From the time that what did he wear? The Prophet ﷺ had a hadith from Aisha Radha Anha. said, start with your right. Even when you put on something, you start with your right. Even when you wash up and make ghusl, you start with your right. Even when you make wudu, you start with your right. Even when you put on your shoes, you start with your right. Even when you step in the masjid, you start with your right. Even when you leave out of the bathroom, you leave out with your right. You step in with your left. There is every aspect of the Prophet ﷺ life is a huda, is a guidance. And we study his life. And henceforth, that's why he had the best example. And he had the best character. Because we needed to study his life in order to use it. You had a beautiful example in him. So Allah had gave him and told him what to do to deal with social ills. And this is what he gave him. And this is what we wanted to bring today, inshallah ta'ala, so that we can arm ourselves with these necessary things to um, combat social ills with practical solutions. And everything that I mentioned was practical. It's not far-fetched. You don't need an encyclopedia. You don't need to travel all the way to Saudi Arabia. You don't need to sit in a million classes. All of this is clear. All you need to know that there are three aspects that you must make sure that you purify. And you start with eternity. That is your mind, that is your heart, and that is your limbs. Do you understand? Your heart is where your aql is at. Your nafs is your soul. And your limbs, your body is that's where it's at. It's going to triple down if you start the right way. If you start with your body before your heart, it's not going to work. If you start with your Try to start with your actions before your heart or your statements is not going to work. You have to start inside to work outside. And this is how you look how Allah Jalla wa Allah deals with these things. Cultivating that heart. The Prophet would spend months, he would spend months out of the year into the cave. He would go retreat, retreat to the cave before he received his revelation. Nourishing himself. And then when the call came and he was made a messenger, he had to come out and call the people. But he already had his heart clean when he was a little boy. He had that heart purified so that he can stand in front of the people and call the people and not be tempted by what they were tempted by. Allah Jalla wa Allah tells Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wasbir nafsika ma'al ladina yad'oona yad'oona Allah or yad'oona Rabbik bil gadati wal ashigi yuriduna wajah Allah wa la ta'adu aynaka anhum turidu zinat al hayat al dun wa la tuti' man aqfawna and In Surah Kahf, the 18th chapter of the Quran, Allah Jalla wa He tells Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sabr, pay attention. He told him to remain patient along with those who call on their Lord night, morning, and afternoon, and the night. They call on their Lord, remain patient. Do not let your eyes look beyond and be deceived or be bedazzled by what you see that other people have other things other people have meaning from the non-believers etc etc do not get caught up into this false illusion don't get caught up in that and do not obey he who heart we have cause to be heedless of our remembrance and he followed his desires and his whole life is upside down the affair of him is is actually cut it's separated you think that they are well put together you go around and look. 
You want to know if a millionaire is well put together, just have a real talk with a, with a millionaire. You want to know people who have all of these stuff, ask me if they well put together. There's no such thing of well put together. The moment you start thinking happiness has something to do with possessions and things outside of you, that's the moment you're not well put together. The Prophet wasallam said, Al-Ghina. He said, richness is not having many belongings. But what is it? He said, it's al qana He said, richness is having contentment. So in other words, he was telling you what? Happiness is within, not without. If you got to pay attention to the hadith, he was telling you happiness is within, not without. So if you're searching out to receive happiness, you're missing the mark. And anybody that's accumulating all of these different things, they're only putting on more mashakal, more problems. Okay? More problems. And they fear that poverty. And they fear that poverty. Why? Because it's in front of their eyes. The accurate is not their concern. So all they sit to do, even though they got more and you see they have a lot of stuff, but they actually fear that they're going to lose it. They're constantly in anxiety because they think they're going to lose it. They're going to lose everything they have. But you look at the person who is a poor slave. Poor. Financially. He doesn't have all of those possessions. She doesn't have all of those things. But she has something or he has something that the president, the king, the ruler, any, no, any um, nobles or notari- um, people who are actually high dignitaries, anyone would envy them over. As Sheikh Rasulullah Mataymiya said, that rally, we have something that if the kings knew what we had, they would use their army to try to get this, their army to fight us and pour swords out to get it from us. And he said, it's al qanaa it's contentment, it's al ghina as the Messenger of Allah is reported to have said, whoever is contented with what they have, content with what they have, even if they have little, that person is rich. Do you understand? So happiness is not without. You want to maintain, don't look there. You want to be upon a person who stay away from these social ills, then all you have to do is do these following steps. Do you warn against shirk? Ask yourself, who do you warn against shirk? Do you know the many different manifestations of shirk? Do you hate shirk? Is shirk despicable to you? Do you dislike it? Do you get annoyed by it? Are you turned off from it? If the answer is no to all of these questions, then you have a problem. If you don't feel no type of way about shirk, then you can't feel nothing about social ill because shirk is a social ill. Someone tell you, yeah, brother, what you talking about? Shirk is a social ill. We are human beings. We are, we are the slaves of Allah. We need to worship. Shirk destroys anything it touch. It is a social ill. Kufr, social ill. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, li ibadihi al-kufr. Allah is not pleased with his servants. To have kufr, to disbelief. Allah is not pleased with it. So kufr, disbelief, shirk, all of these things the Lord is not pleased with. These things are detrimental to society. The hoot the hoot, meaning the what? The hoopo. What did he do? When that bird saw Sheba worshipping something other than what she's supposed to be worshipping, Allah Azza wa Jal, he told Suleiman, what happened? That was a crime. Why do you think Suleiman wrote her a letter? Why do you think he actually got her thrown? Why do you think he actually told her to come to her as a come to him as a Muslim? Why do you think he did that? Because shirk, which her people were committing, was a grave crime. It was destroying the society. And until we view shirk like that, until we view shirk just like a earthquake or just like a a pollution, until we view shirk as detrimental to society, then you know we're not going to hit the mark. That's why we're not avid callers, because we don't see shirk like that. Somebody worshiping a cross, somebody worshiping a grave, a statue, somebody worshiping a saint, somebody worshiping a prophet, doesn't bother you and I. We go, we eat, we drink, we sleep, that's, all, that's no problem. Something is wrong with that. Something is really wrong with that. You have to analyze that. You want to address social ills, then address the core of it. It is directing a person connection to other than the creator. And as long as they keep doing that, the longest they're going to do what they want to do out here and we're going to be destroyed. So Allah Jalla wa Ala said, Kun fa'andir. Allah knew it was a problem. So he told Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, stand up with it. Yeah, you're going to face some, a lot of problems. Mashakil. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam got rocks thrown at him by kids. 
They threw rocks at him. You understand? He was bleeding. This is what's going to happen. You can talk all day. We can stay in the masjid. We can read all our key to books all we want. But the reality of it, you want to address social ill, dress the main ill there is. That's shirk. Kun fa anthir. Warn against what? That's shirk. Kun fa anthir. Until we stand up against shirk. It's many manifestations. Stand up against kufr. It's many manifestations. Stand up against bid'ah. It's many manifestations. Stand up against dunu. And then it's many manifestations. Once we look at that and stand up as avid callers, then we can begin to address social ills. We can begin to resist social ills only by doing that. Then by being avid worshippers ourselves of Tawheed. And this is what we was able to bring today, inshallah ta'ala. And we're going to end, inshallah. We thank the brothers for allowing us to be able to speak. Um, there are other people who are more eloquent than me as well and more knowledgeable than me actually to speak. But please ponder on these verses. It's Surah 74, Surah Mutathir. Um, look at the Prophet Sallallahu life. Always go back. I remember when we was in Egypt and Sheikh Raslan, he was saying that if a person wants to know Minhaj, then let him study the Sirah or the biography of the Prophet Sallallahu And that's where we as a Muslim, that should be our go-to. The Quran and the Sunnah really should be your go-to. When you say Sunnah, it shouldn't be Sheikh Fulan and Alan. That's not what we mean by your go-to. Sheikh Alan Fulan is helping you to understand it, but they shouldn't be your go-to. And I know people are going to grind me up for this, but that's just the reality. Your go-to should be the Prophet Sirah, his biography. What did he do? How did he do? How did he act? Ibn Al-Qayyim wrote a whole book, which became to four volumes in English once they translated, which is called Zad Al-Ma'ad. Do you know what he was writing it from? Do you understand that book? He read it on a journey. No books, no pens, no nothing. Guess who it was about? It was about the Prophet Wasallam. It was basically about his biography. Extracting points and benefits that the Muslim can take in his daily lives. Dealing with issues of Jumu'ah. Dealing with different other issues of this. Dealing with this issue. Down to his cooking pot. How many swords he had. How many slaves he had. How many this or that. His utensils. The different types of kormis that he wore. None of us know these things. I can ask him... <laughs> Actually, for like five different things that the Prophet Sallallahu wore, none of us can tell it. None. But we say we follow Sunnah. We say we result the Sunnah. We say we use Sunnah. Right? <laughs> no, we don't use Sunnah. We ain't in detail with Sunnah. But this is the point I'm trying to make. Arm yourselves and be avid callers. And the moment we get to that level, we'll start resisting social ills. And that meaning is that we make sure our home, those under our control, first and foremost, start with yourself. Then start with your family if you have one. Then start with your children. Then start with your kith and kin. This is how the Dawah of the Prophet ﷺ started. Before he went out to his community, he started with those in his circle. He started with himself. He started with his family. He started with those in his circle. And this is how Dawah actually propagated. And this is how we deal with social ills. So inshallah ta'ala, that's what we were able to bring. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdi, ashadu ala astakwatu wa ilayk. Whoever doesn't thank the people doesn't thank Allah. I thank all of you for tuning in. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. And the brothers that filed to initiative, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you all. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa